I was busking in Birmingham Just trying to get by It was a May day, it was a grey day The castle I struck up my guitar, played my emigrant songs. The rocky road to Dublin and the old rocks. I always had an interest in history and I started reading the reports and the minutes of the meetings of the Board of Guardians who, who ran the workhouse. I started seeing things like about famine, cholera and poverty. You know, things I'd, I'd, I'd learned in school but they were sort of remote. But suddenly, this came to life in the pages in front of me. This is Carlo. This was not the west of Ireland, this was not Skibbereen, but in the town here that I was born in and grew up in. So it had a real relevance to me. The workers also had two sheds constructed for dormitories for 250 inmates in May of 1847. By October 1847, even the graveyards were overcrowded and the master reported it was necessary to bury the dead at night in graves already used. However, faced with this gruesome practice, the Guardians decided to bury the paupers in the workhouse grounds, which I presume is this graveyard now, um, in pits which would contain three or four tiers of coffins. The overcrowding of the workhouse naturally helped spread disease. By 1847, the workhouse, which was built to accommodate 800, had a total of 1,493 people in its care. All others seeking admission were turned away without any assistance that's just some of the issues that come out of the early minute books. But, and they can be accessed by anybody in the local studies section of Carlow Library. All the minute books are there and they're, they're a treasure trove of information. When we were last here in 2019 and then there was an interruption of two years, it occurred to me that it would be fantastic if this place, which represents kind of death and desolation, became a place of biodiversity, of hope and life. And I met actually Jeanette shortly after that and we had a great discussion and we had great plans. But Jeanette has been doing fantastic work in the meantime. I was thrilled when Joe reached out to talk to me, I suppose, around the role of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are a suite of 17 goals and they're a roadmap really for humanity to improve peace, prosperity, planet and people going forward. Uh, the goals range from number one, no poverty, which is so appropriate from where we are today. There's peace and justice, there's equality, there's climate action, there's zero hunger. And I suppose then you have Global Goal 17, which is partnership for the goals. And for me, it's the most important goal that's there because without partnership, we're nothing. We reflect on our history and our times, but it also raises our awareness about the injustice, the inequality, the war, the poverty that's going on around the world. What makes us human is that we have memory. That's why uh, illnesses like dementia and Alzheimer's are such a tragedy, because we forget who we are. We lose part of our identity. And when we stand on a place like this, a place steeped in history and in tragedy and other people's stories, we must ask ourselves another question. What do we stand for? People have been through so much that have been on this site. And I think this tree represents all of those people, but it also represents life and the value of life and how special it is and how unique it is. And to have a tree to represent the biodiversity that will be here, I think is going to be very important. I think it's a nice uh, symbol and a reminder as we remember those who, as Father Martin said, were our ancestors that went before us, that suffered throughout Ireland's famine. To continue our celebration, if you like, what we were doing earlier today and what we've been doing all week, this exhibition around on Gorta Moor. We were reminded today that it's 175 years this year. So I'm very pleased to welcome Denise and Jim and Joe from AFRI and Dr. Regina, who's going to give us some background to the exhibition and to on Gorta Moor. Very welcome. Thanks a million. I'm one of the social care lecturers here and part of the course, what we try to do is we try to teach students about the importance of knowing your history. What's quite amazing is that the site that this college where we're training people who are going to go out and be part of maybe making people's lives more meaningful and helping them get back on track in their own journey, that this same site was a place of hurt and pain and death 175 years ago. And it really brings it home to us. 
when I was talking to Joe and he was saying that we, you know, we normally do the famine walk, I was saying, well, I'm getting my students to do some artwork. And then myself and Jim have been very interested in learning more about the famine. And we've done a lot of traveling to the different workhouses around and seeing the artwork that's being produced. Obviously, you can see Jim has been working on uh, sculptures and paintings all around the theme. That's the impact that it has had on him. And it was just so wonderful that we had this opportunity to bring all of that together in one place with yourselves that we can share in this and talk about, I suppose, what history means to us so that we don't ever forget. People in the workhouses used to have to pick a certain weight of oakum in order to get fed. I wanted to experience what picking oakum felt like, to feel the tedium of it and to connect myself with the labour that was involved in the people in the workhouse. Picking oakum was also used as a punishment in prisons. It's, it's referenced in the Ballad of Reading Jail by uh, Oscar Wilde. I wasn't happy with the emotional impact of the image. So I experimented with Hessian because of all those childhood memories of potatoes coming in Hessian sacks. I tried to get the figures to look like they were going through some sort of emotional hardship. We found it very fascinating in the history pod to see that so many people passed through these doors on this exact site. When you think that there was 3,000 buried in the grave on the green road at the back of this site. And then there was God only knows how many buried in Clyde graveyard and in Quinna graveyard and God only knows where else. And one of the other things that we're still looking into is the young teenage girls that would have been taken from the workhouse and put on ships, the Lady Peel and the Panama, and sent to Australia, uh, never to return to Ireland. Can you imagine the fear and uh, how afraid they must have been after being taken from their families, end up in a workhouse and end up on a ship, probably on a 100-day voyage across the world to a new life. So we're still trying to find some of them. We, indeed, we have found some of them. The ones we haven't found, I'm guessing, is not going to be a happy ending. We just don't want to forget what happened here on this site uh, so many years ago. And we're very proud and happy to be involved in this. And hopefully next year we will have a bigger exhibition and have more information and more art for people to see and realise what happened on this site. One thing I was struck when Jim was talking about the sculptures and he said that he didn't feel he got the emotion right. Well, let me tell you, you've got it right now because I was walking down the path and I could see them through the glass outside and I actually got that pang. It's really hard to explain it, but I thought, oh my God, these are famine victims. I could identify them from coming down the path. Just as a means of visually representing how significant the population decrease was in this second half of the 19th century, you can literally see that once we get to 1845, the population sort of, it, it literally kind of falls off a cliff. The decrease <coughs> in the space of five years is absolutely phenomenal. The population falls from just above 8 million um, on the eve of the famine to 6 million within the space of three years. So it's a phenomenal decrease. And importantly, it is a decrease that continues well into the 20th century. It's a great privilege really to be here. It's actually very emotional to hear what has been said but I think particularly to see the exhibition outside. I've been involved in commemorating the famine since about 1984 and I've seen many exhibitions and visited many commemorations of the famine but nothing I've ever seen has affected me I think in the same way as that exhibition outside. The images are extraordinary. The emotional connection is powerful and amazing and I really think that something new and radical has been discovered, has been created, and I hope it will be taken around the country and beyond because it really deserves and needs to be seen. Joe referenced Pete St. John, but another great man has died this year, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, and we invited him to a conference in 1982. He wasn't allowed to attend by the apartheid regime at the time, but he came in 1984 and he spoke to a packed audience in Sean McDermott Street in Dublin. And he told a story which began what we call the Great Famine Project. He told a story about meeting a young girl in a township in South Africa and asking her, what does she do for food? And she said, we borrow food. And he said, do you ever return the food that you borrow? And she said, no. 
and he said, what do you do when you can't borrow food? And he, she said, we drink water to fill our stomachs in a country that exports food around the world. And when he said that, it was like a penny dropped about our own history because people died in Ireland, not because there was no food, but because the poor could not get access to food. So, McCree, I'll always love you. Storm McCree, thanks very much, folks. Thank you.